Yes, good morning. Uh, we have two students online. Perfect. Mm. So if we could have uh, one of you pray. Jeffina, is that OK? Would you be able to pray? Sure. Go ahead then. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of prayer that we have to the message. God, as we are about to start the class, we just invite you uh, to be with us, to guide us in your work. We are blessed, Pastor Deepika, in the name of Jesus, fill her with your wisdom and anointing that she can share this deep truth in the Bible in a way that we can understand Jesus. And God, I pray for all the classmates who are about to come. Help them to come on time and work give us good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. Let the revelation of who you are, who we are in you, and what we are called to do uh, be extended in our minds. Open our spiritual minds, our spiritual eyes, and spiritual eyes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we begin. So we're back. Oh my. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. I think there was a temporary issue with the internet, but then we are back online. Uh, so, yes, uh, we will be doing chapters 20 and 21 today. Uh, if I could please have, you know, volunteers reading out the verses even as I request. Uh, you know, we'll just go through this uh, as quickly as possible. So we can begin uh, with verses 1 to 10, I guess. If we could have someone please read out for us the first 10 verses of chapter 20, uh, we will look at some details regarding this. Uh, so John chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. If anyone online could please read out for us these 10 verses. Go ahead, please. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and so that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid them. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple whom, who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. 
Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Thank you. So uh, we see that early on the first day of the week, uh, we have Mary Magdalene coming here to the tomb. And then when we look at the other Gospels, we learn that at least five ladies were there. You know, so different uh, Gospels give us uh, a portion of the information. So when we put it all together, uh, we observe that at least five ladies, if not more, as a group, they all come here to the tomb on the um, first day of the week. Now, in the Jewish calendar, you would have the day beginning in the evening. OK, so as the sun goes down, that that day is now considered ended and a new day begins. So at sunset on Saturday, that uh, um, the day is now considered complete. The Sabbath day is complete. And now a new day would have begun, you know, uh, even as it becomes dark. So on the first day of the week, many, many hours after sunset, early in the morning is when these ladies have now come uh, to complete some of the burial honors, which could not be done earlier. Because if you remember, this was a high Sabbath. This was a special, uh, this was um, a Sabbath day when you would also have a, a festival being celebrated. So those would be called your high Sabbaths. And so on this high Sabbath, the Passover was celebrated. So uh, for the sake of those festivities, uh, you know, they had to quickly uh, take down the three uh, crucified persons. And uh, so uh, Jesus uh, was buried quickly, you know, wrapped in linen. But all the ceremonies which are involved were not performed at that time. Uh, last week, we had looked a little bit at uh, some of the burial rituals which they practiced in their day. Uh, so um, we saw that you know uh, when a um, member of the family uh, who has passed away is placed inside the family tomb, uh, that body is laid out in one particular portion of the of the large cave um, for about maybe one year two years until all the moisture inside the body gets uh, you know uh, evaporates and uh, you have all the internal organs drying up uh, and you know the skin will shrivel up and stick to the bones and after all that has happened uh, so uh, the word that would be used is desiccation. After the body, uh, the body has become desiccated and dried out, then they would be able to uh, put it in one in a box called an ossuary, and then they would place it in one of the compartments, you know, which have been carved out, out of the walls of the cave. So you would have entire generations being buried in that way. So the entire family would be, you know, placed in the family tomb. Uh, so. Um, which is why to kind of speed up that desiccation process, uh, they would bury the uh, body along with herbs and spices and uh, other things which will aid, you know, in the in that entire burial process. So this all of these details could not be taken care of, uh, you know, when Jesus was uh, brought down from the cross. Uh, so everything had to be done in a hurry. So now these women have now come here to finish the procedure. So they come along with spices and herbs uh, to honor uh, the body of Jesus in this manner. So when they enter into the, I mean, the details are not given over here about how they, you know, they wonder among themselves who's going to help them in opening the uh, tomb um, stone. Uh, because you see, this, this, these would be family tombs. Uh, so they would not want anyone disturbing the remains inside. So generally, these tombs would be blocked by a very large uh, rock. And um, so in front of that cave, uh, they would probably carve out a kind of deep channel. And this very, very large stone would be rolled and placed inside that groove, inside that channel, so that if someone wants to open the entrance, they would literally have to ro uh, you know, roll it along that groove, open it up. And then once they have finished with whatever procedures they want to do, the stone is rolled back 
So the stone kind of sits inside a groove which has been carved out for that purpose, and it serves like a sign kind of uh, doorway. Uh, so uh, these ladies are wondering uh, who would help them in opening up that. And then when they come over there, they see that already the stone has been rolled away. All of those details are not mentioned over here in the um, Gospel of John. Uh, we just get to know that they uh, go inside. And when they look inside, they realize that the uh, body of Jesus is no longer there. And we are told in verse 2 that Mary Magdalene, she immediately runs to the disciples to inform them uh, what has happened. And these are the words that she uses. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So in her mind, she's assuming that whoever they are, some enemies of the Lord have come and they have stolen the body just to maybe dishonor the body. And she is very deeply upset about it. And so she immediately goes and informs uh, the disciples regarding this. And so we see two of the disciples quickly running to the tomb to confirm whether what has been said is indeed true. And so you have Peter and John uh, running over here to the tomb and they look inside and when they look inside they see that the strips of linen were lying there um, now uh, the word that is used in the greek is not really the word which is used for folded i mean those are some translations use the word folded it just means the word used over this is, is uh, indicates something that is just lying in its place it could be something that is folded and kept in its place, or it could just be something that is lying in its place, which is why NIV tries to you know, use that kind of a, uh, uh, of, of a translation, just to kind of bring out the meaning of what these two disciples see when they look in. Um, uh, so it could either mean that someone neatly folded up the linen and kept it, you know, uh, um, all the body linen was kept in one place and that uh, the linen used for the head was placed at an, in, a, in, a, in a different place. Or it could mean that everything was just in place as it was when they had uh, left, you know, uh, immediately after the burial. So either it could be that when jesus rose up when he resurrected he literally just came out through the cloth and the cloth remained in the same position in which it had been when uh, he was buried so he could have maybe evaporated through the cloth and come out because you see uh, now uh, solid objects don't seem to be an issue for his resurrected body he goes in and out of walls as he wishes so it could be in that sense that everything was still lying in place in the form of a body, but there is no body inside. Or it could be that uh, maybe angels came down and folded the linen uh, and kept it you know, in, in a folded position. So we don't really know uh, what is indicated over here. But one thing is very clear, that no grave robbery has taken place. Because if someone wanted to steal the body, and for some reason they wanted to um, remove the linen before they steal the body, what would they have done? You know, they'd have removed the linen and just scattered it all over the place, and then they would have left with the body. They would not have neatly folded it and kept it in place, or it would not still be retaining the same shape of the dead body. That would not be the case. You would, in fact, maybe see strips of linen for, uh, fallen all over the place in case there had been a robbery. So over here, what John is trying to uh, clearly indicate to his uh, readers is that even though Magdalene, Mary Magdalene goes and says they have taken the Lord, that is not what has occurred. There has been no robbery of any kind. Rather, Jesus has risen. And the linen, the positioning of the linen indicates that uh, no robbery has taken place. So most probably, when he resurrected, he just simply rose out through the cloth. And the cloth maybe just stayed over there in the shape of the body. And he's no longer inside it because he has resurrected. So that probably is the explanation. Uh, so we have this being um, you know, briefly referred to even in Luke, where it says Peter looked at it and went, went away wondering what it meant when he saw these strips of linen in the position in which they were. He, it, it just says over there, he looked at the linen and he went away wondering what it could mean. 
so i my assumption is that maybe the uh, he just uh, jesus just literally came out from the cloth without even disturbing the cloth and it just was positioned as it was originally uh, when it talks about the handkerchief the translation which is used in some of the bibles regarding the head uh, cloth that would just basically be the cloth which would you know which is generally used to keep the jaw closed in place uh, because you know once the person passes away the jaw kind of opens up so they keep the tie a cloth around the face uh, to hold the jaw in place uh, so that is i position near the head the rest of the linen is you know positioned uh, you know a little away from that uh, so um, all that john is trying to communicate to us is that no robbery has taken place the body was not disturbed in any way it's just that uh, jesus has vanished he has resurrected so up to here the storyline is rather clear after that things get a bit puzzling if we were to do a comparison of the four gospels uh, so what are the passages um, you know in case you are interested you could just jot it down um, so in matthew um, it would be matthew 28 Verses five to eight in Mark it would be Mark sixteen two to eight in Luke twenty four it would be verses one to eight and of course here in John we are looking at John chapter twenty so in Matthew we see one angel being mentioned who comes and tells the women uh, not to be afraid and that Jesus has risen up and that they should go and inform the uh, disciples about it because later on he is going to come and meet them in Galilee. that's the message which this one single angel gives in matthew but when you look at mark um yeah in mark 2 you see a young man uh, they they see a young man sitting at the right uh, wearing a white robe in luke it talks about two men or two angels in dazzling clothing uh, which you know shining clothes uh, so um and uh, here in john again we have two angels being mentioned so based on these eyewitness accounts of these ladies who have actually seen these angels we get the impression that they were not all standing together and they did not see the angels together so what do we assume most probably you know we have these two disciples coming running over there to the tomb to confirm whether indeed the body has disappeared they see that this has happened they go back to their home but it looks like as if these women continue to stand around wondering what to do and may, most probably they kind of spread out to go searching to see whether his body has been hidden somewhere nearby so they probably spread out and so some of them encounter one angel some of them encounter two angels you know so that is why we have a difference in the eyewitness reports that are being given and um, it looks as though mary magdalene has somehow you know uh, is kind of separated from the others uh, because they all have their encounters with the angels they are terrified they are excited they quickly run back and tell the disciples you know we've seen angels and the angels are saying that uh, jesus has risen so that's the report which they have given but it looks like mary has kind of been got separated maybe she went searching farther or far than the others i mean i do not know but now she has come back and she's still standing over there near the tomb and she's weeping because she's heartbroken that someone would do something so cruel where they would actually steal the body of her master and so as she is weeping she looks inside that would be in verse 12 and she sees two angels in white and they say to her why are you crying that would be in verse 13 and this is again what she says in verse 13 she says they have taken away my lord where they have put him i do not know so she's still thinking about it in terms of a robbery and the angels do not say anything to her because jesus himself is going to take give her the message about his resurrection so she kind of looks back and she sees a person standing over there she does not recognize him which means that jesus now looks different from the way he did earlier and uh, so she just assumes that maybe he is the you know caretaker of that place and so uh, she says to him Uh, in verse 15 sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have put him and i will get him you know i mean it shows the deep 
commitment and devotion and the gratitude that this lady has because you see the lord delivered her from all those demons that had they were persecuting her and had made her life miserable she's so grateful for, to the lord for what he has done and now she is so um, you know uh, heartbroken that she's unable to find the body and then jesus says to her mary and that one word is enough it opens her spiritual eyes and she realizes that she is literally in the presence of her master even though he looks different and so then in in the aramaic language she says rabboni which basically means teacher and so obviously she might she either probably fell down at his feet i know and held on to his to his feet or she was holding on to his arm we don't really know but basically she's very thrilled very very happy and then jesus says to her in verse 17 do not hold on to me for i have not yet ascended to the father go instead to my brothers and tell them i am ascending to my father and your father to my god and your god uh, so earlier you know we had um, the early translation saying do not touch me as though in some way uh, a human being touching him would contaminate him in some manner and that was bringing out a very wrong meaning so now uh, most of the translations are careful including nkjv they're all careful to you know use the um, the more accurate greek translation so even nkjv now it says do not cling to me is what jesus is saying so all he's he's not saying don't touch me because he's going to get contaminated in some way no not at all i mean throughout his ministry he happily went and touched lepers and he never got contaminated so this is not about uh, a, anything um, or in anything wrong being done by someone touching him uh, rather he is saying don't cling on because there's one final thing that has to be done uh, here so he says i i am ascending to my father and your father go tell this to my brothers so uh, we get the indication that some kind of an ascension takes place at this point now we know that jesus continues to stay for 40 days he interacts with a lot of people he meets them shows them that he is alive uh, so all that happens for 40 days and then bodily physically he ascends but now at this particular point something does take place and most probably this is um, you know the what we uh, read about in hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 to 15 where we are told that this jesus christ our high priest uh, in hebrews 9 you know it says especially in verse 12 it says he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption so uh, now this is purely theory because we don't know the details jesus does not mention the details over here in the, uh, you know in the in the gospels um maybe in spirit he goes into the tabernacle not the human temple the actual uh, you know the human tabernacle was a representation of what is there in heaven where you literally have the most holy place where you have the triune god seated uh, so he goes over there to that most holy place not the earthly one in spirit probably he goes over there and he declares you know see i have completed the work of atonement the word atonement means you know peace being made between god and humans so i have now made the atonement uh, so uh, therefore i have now obtained eternal redemption for humankind so he goes in goes in over there presents the sacrifice which he has made the perfect sacrifice and uh, thereby what happens you know if you continue to read over there in hebrews 9 in verse 13 why does he do this uh, it says in hebrews 9 13 the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean um, cannot sanctify them um, um, ah, okay it can sanctify them so that they are outwardly unclean but what does jesus christ do the blood of christ it says in verse 14 it cleanses our, our very consciences so it's not just outwardly that we are made clean he literally cleanses from uh, us on the inside so this is something that happens i think 
immediately after Jesus makes his announcement to Mary Magdalene and he says, I will go and uh, I will be tell go tell my brothers because you see this is his immediate family. He first wants to assure them and inform them. I'm fine. Everything is good. You know, everything is because they're, they're in mourning. So he needs to assure them. So after he has told this, I'm assuming that in spirit he goes, presents himself in the most holy place in the heavens with his blood to show that now the eternal redemption has been accomplished. And so by doing this, he, everyone who now believes in him and has been following him, not only are they going to be outwardly made clean, they are, their conscience is going to be cleansed. From the inside out, they are going to be cleansed. So this work of redemption takes place now in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm. And um, uh, then Jesus makes an appearance to different peoples. He, you know, he makes an appearance to uh, on the road to uh, leading to Emmaus, where he appears to two uh, two disciples, uh, to two followers. Um, and then later on in the evening, he comes and he visits the uh, disciples. So um, I am assuming that this is the sequence of events which takes place. So he says now over here to her before he uh, he does this, he says to her. Uh, don't cling on to me because for I have not yet ascended to the father. So he, he this is something that he needs to do. And then he says, go tell my brothers. He doesn't say go tell my followers, go tell my disciples. He's now talking to family members because now through his redemptive act, we have become family, actual literal immediate family. Amazing. And he says, I'm ascending to my father and your father. So you see now uh, this um, heavenly father is uh, our father as well, because now through this redemptive act, we have been bought literally into the family of God. So this is an amazing thing which the Lord says over here. And having said this, you know, um, so Magdalene, uh, Mary Magdalene stops clinging to him. She quickly runs back to give the good news. Uh, so that would be in verse 18. Uh, uh, where it says, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Uh, so the first eyewitness report of the resurrected Jesus is given to a woman. Uh, now in the ancient culture of that time, women were never regarded as um, trustworthy eyewitnesses. Uh, so in case there is a court case, you know, in case something has happened and there's a court case uh, being conducted, it's always the male witnesses who are called to give their testimony in the court. Never a woman. You may have three women standing over there and having witnessed the same event. But when the court case is being uh, conducted, it's always the male witnesses who are called simply because the status of women was not good in those days. They felt that women cannot give a clear testimony. They will not be able to tell this, present the facts clearly. And yet here, Jesus deliberately chooses a woman uh, to be his uh, you know, first eyewitness who will go and report to people and say, I have seen him. I mean, it just shows the way Jesus, the way God looks at women so differently from the way you know the people of that time looked at women. Uh, so this is just an important point. Because you see, um, if somebody living in those days wanted to choose their first eyewitness of something as spectacular as a resurrection, they would probably have chosen a Roman, an important Roman official, or they would have chosen some important um, Jewish leader. But Jesus chooses to make his first appearance to a woman. And she becomes the first one to go and give the testimony of what she has seen. It just shows that God looks at his people in very different way from the way world, the world looks at them. Um, all right. So uh, now in the evening, after having finished appearing to um, the, you know, the two followers on the road to Emmaus and then having appeared probably to other people, I mean, we do not know who else Jesus appeared to on that particular day. Finally, in the evening, of that same day, Sunday, on the say of the same day, now he comes here to the disciples, where it clearly says to us, when the doors were shut, it says in verse 19, the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they have locked themselves up 
here somewhere in some in you know, in some place in Galilee because they are afraid of um, all the events which have taken place. Their master has been crucified, not following legal procedures. You know, legal procedures were bent to make him uh, to have him crucified. So now they are wondering what would be the consequences for them. So reports have been coming in throughout the day. First was Mary Magdalene coming with this shocking news that she literally saw him. Before that, the ladies had come saying that the angels are saying that he's resurrected. Then uh, the men from Emos, they also come and report saying they have seen uh, him. All these reports have been coming in, but they have not believed. Uh, and that is very clearly brought out in Mark. OK, so it's not really mentioned over here. But in Mark, we get to know that they have not believed in spite of hearing all these reports which have been coming into their ears throughout the day. And now Jesus himself is standing over there. He does not knock on the door. He literally just comes into the room through the uh, wall. And he says to them, peace be with you. So over here, we are just told that Jesus says, peace be with you. But in Mark, we get to know that he rebukes them for not having believed all the reports which were brought to them. Uh, so in Mark, if you were if you were to read uh, Mark 16, verse 11, um, uh, it, it talks about Mary Magdalene. Uh, and it says in Mark 16, 11, um, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. And then it says about these people from uh, Emmaus uh, in verse 13, they, these returned and reported reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And then in verse 14, it says that Jesus comes over there to them. And it says he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So uh, because if you remember in the final weeks leading up to the crucifixion, again and again, he had spoken about this. He had spoken about how for a little while he will go away and then he will come back you know, and all of that. And they just somehow could not understand those um, things. So now he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And then you know, he's, uh, he says to them, peace be with you. So he is assuring them that um, he will take care of them. They do not need to be afraid. And then in verse 20 onwards, uh, you know, John 20, verse 20 onwards, he shows them his hands. He shows them his side. So we get to know that even though he now has a resurrected body, he retains these marks of the crucifixion. And um, in fact, even in Revelation, when we see it talks about the lamb who looked as though it had been slain. You know, it, it, uh, that's the wording that is used over there. So uh, Jesus has chosen for all eternity to retain those marks. And in that sense, he uh, he's standing over there in the presence of the Father, and he's interceding in that sense, in the sense of he's over there showing always for eternity that I have mediated on behalf of the humans. And therefore, now the propitiation has been uh, uh, full, you know, paid, and uh, the, uh, the atonement is now complete. So those marks are always an indication that he has done this on our behalf, and therefore now peace is established between God and us, and we can call God our Father in the same way that Jesus calls him my Father. It is an amazing, amazing status that has been given to us. Um, so Jesus has retained those marks, and he shows them to his disciples, and it says that they are overjoyed. Um, and then he says to them again in verse 21, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. You know, So uh, Jesus was sent to the earth with a great commission so that, uh, that humankind can be restored once again to the Lord. And Jesus fulfilled his part of the commission. Now he's passing on to them their part of the commission. And he's saying in the same way the father sent me, now I'm sending you. You need to go and tell people what I have finished, the work that I have completed, so that they too can be restored to the Father in the same way all of you, you know, have you been restored to the Father. And so um, having said that, in verse 22, it says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And what had he said to them earlier? 
you know, when he was uh, speaking to them in John chapter 16, um, if you were to look at that entire portion, John 16 verses 7 to 11, over there, you know, we had read, uh, Jesus had said, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Okay. Uh, so now he seems to have gone into the heavenly realm and presented himself over there uh, as the atonement that is required. And now having completed that, he can now impart the spirit to them in such a way that the spirit will now reside inside them. Up to now, the Holy Spirit could be with them, but he could not be in them. But now that he has finished this high priestly act in the most holy place in the heavenlies, he can uh, very, you know, very freely, generously say to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and in a moment, they just will. So that has now become possible. Uh, so great, amazing, eternal things took place on that day. It must have been a most, um, uh, uh, you know, amazing experience for these disciples to to have, you know, uh, experienced all of that. And so, you know, he says to them, "I'm sending you," and he breathes on on them. They receive the Holy Spirit, and he says, "Now that this has happened, verse 23: If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven." Uh, again, you see, he is referring to um, uh, what he had talked about and explained to them earlier in John 16, because he said, uh, if I go away, I will send the advocate to you. And what will the advocate do? You know, in John, John 16, he says, when he comes, he will prove to the world, uh, the world to be in the wrong. He will convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So in that sense, now the believers can speak to people about the gospel and they can declare to them, through the Holy Spirit about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So when they speak out this truth of the gospel, convict the people of their uh, They will not convict, of course. They will only speak. And the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sins. The Holy Spirit will tell them about sin and righteousness. So if the people, who, if the people accept it, their sins will stand forgiven. If they do not accept it, if they reject it, then their sins will remain upon them. So in that sense, verse 23 should be taken, you know, in line with the explanation which is given by Jesus in John chapter 16. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven in that sense. Because the, through the, these disciples who are being sent out, the Holy Spirit will convict. He will do his work of bringing people to the Lord. If they choose to believe that true message, yes, their sins will be forgiven. If they refuse it, you know, their, uh, they was, their sins will not be forgiven. So here in verse 23, it's not talking about any human leader speaking over a person and saying, I declare your sins forgiven. This is not talking about some kind of um, human confession ritual. We cannot go up to a spiritual leader and say, I'm coming to you. Please forgive me uh, my sins even as I confess them to you. No, humans will not cannot offer you forgiveness. It's a divine act that has to be done by the Holy Spirit who does that work of conviction inside the person. So if that person repents, then uh, the righteousness which, Jesus, uh, which the Holy Spirit is telling them about, that will come to them if they have accepted Jesus Christ. So verse 23 is not talking about us going to a leader and confessing our sins and that, that human leader declaring, oh, I forgive your sins. It is not talking about that. We cannot separate what Jesus taught in John chapter 16 with what is happening over here. The two are connected, and we need to take them in that sense. All right. Um, so, uh, if Jesus over here is breathing upon them, they have received the Holy Spirit. Whatever is going to occur next in their ministry is going to happen through the Holy Spirit. It's not human beings who are going to go around declaring people's sins forgiven and forgiving them. It's a divine work of the Holy Spirit that's going to take place, which is why, you know, when we talk about sharing the gospel, that's all we are doing. We are testifying and saying, see, this is what Jesus did for me in my life. This is what I have learned from the scriptures. This is what the Lord has taught me from the scriptures about eternal life. So we just, we just go and we testify and we share and we, and we tell about these things. 
It's the Holy Spirit who does that internal work of transforming that person and bringing them to the Lord. All right. So we do our part. The Holy Spirit who is inside us, he does the eternal work of converting those people and bringing them into the fold of the Lord. Uh, so please let us not take this verse as, uh, as talking about some kind of human confession made to a human leader or, or some kind of spiritual uh, authority. No, it's not talking about that. All right. So uh, that was an important point that we needed to dwell upon. Um, now let's move to uh, verses 24 onwards. Um, if we could have someone uh, read out for us, please, uh, verses John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. Verses 24 to 29, if someone could read out from John chapter 20. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Yes. So uh, people generally give uh, Thomas a bad rep. You know, they say, oh, my, the man refused to believe. But even the other disciples also did the same thing. And Jesus rebuked them as well. I know. So um, they only after they saw with their own eyes, uh, when he showed the, the marks in his hands and his side, they, they, it says, you know, they were overjoyed and they believed. So Thomas too is following in the same footsteps. He too has to see and only only then he will be willing to believe. So he waits another eight days before he actually chooses to believe. So Jesus says, reach out your hand, put it into my side. I think he actually doesn't do that. He's just, um, you know, uh, I mean, someone just walked in through the wall. I mean, the doors were closed. I think that itself was, was enough for him. Uh, so he says, my Lord and my God, you know, so... Uh, we got to remember, you know, this was the Thomas who was willing to go with Jesus uh, to Lazarus, um, you know, and say, if he's going to be killed, well, let's die with him. You know, see, these are these are good men. These are men who who loved the Lord. Uh, so now, you know, he, he is willing to believe. And Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So you and I are those great people who did you have not physically seen the marks in his hands. We have not physically, you know, uh, put our hand in his side, but we have believed. And the Lord has himself has spoken a blessing over us. So, you know, we can, we can remind the Lord and say, Lord, you said that we are blessed. So I think that blessing rests upon each of us, all of us believers, who did not get to see with our eyes what these disciples saw. And yet, by faith, through the convicting of the Holy Spirit, we have chosen to believe. I know, so we are blessed. So John wrote these words for his first time readers because many of them did not get to see. They were not there in that room when Jesus appeared. And they all chose this account which John wrote. You know, they chose to, to read it, believe what John has written over here. And uh, so he was telling them, you people are blessed because we got, we, we, we got to see. You didn't get to see, but still you have chosen to believe. And the Lord himself said that you people are blessed because you have chosen to believe in this way. So it would have been a great encouragement to his readers to know that this is what Jesus said about them. And the same encouragement you know, is given even to us. We are blessed because we have chosen to believe him. Um, and uh, so over here, uh, we see um, you know, um, John concluding and, he, and, and saying in verse 31, um, uh, yeah, in verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs, you know, which are not recorded, 
but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you know, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So in the name of Jesus, we have life, eternal life in us. So Jesus never said that we will not have trials and difficulties. Those will always be there. But the power of his name, it is with us. Because what does Jesus say in his intercessory prayer? You know, if you remember when we covered that, he says, uh, the power of your name, you know, uh, Lord, let it be with them so that they will be protected. They will be kept safe. So yes, trials will be there. Um, everyday difficulties would be there. Persecution, in fact, also would be there. But that name, that power of that name, that's always there with us. So as long as we choose to believe in this Jesus, choose to believe what he has said in his word, choose to uh, believe to the extent where we submit and obey, the power of his name is always with us. He will be there to take care of us. And which is why he says, you know, when he's talking to his disciples, he says, um, you will face trials, but do not fear. Um, you know, do not be what? Do not be disheartened. Because I have overcome the world, is what the Lord says. So he is with us. Uh, we can have that confidence that no matter what we are facing, uh, you know, the, the Lord is always by our side through his name because we trust in that name. Uh, so this is the privilege which is granted to us. Um, so we will um, now be looking into John chapter 21. Um, if... Um, you know, before we'll let's just get into the you know chapter. Maybe we can cover at least a few verses. Uh, so in John chapter twenty-one, uh, we see that um, these disciples have chosen uh, to go fishing um, to the by, you know, by, to the Sea of Galilee. All right. So in John chapter twenty-one, verse one is where it says that Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And we are told uh, that uh, later on in one of the verses that this was the third appearance that Jesus makes uh, to his disciples. So the first, of course, was immediately on that same day, the resurrection day in the evening. The second occasion, of course, was when Thomas was present. And now this is the third time when he comes to these uh, you know, 11 disciples. Uh, because one of them was a traitor, he's gone. Uh, but then we have 11 disciples here. Uh, so this is the third appearance of Jesus to these people. And in uh, verse 2 um, and 3, we get to know that they decide to go fishing. And there's a lot of negative things that are said about the disciples going fishing, as though they have abandoned the Lord and gone back into the world and all of that. But we don't really see this anywhere in the New Testament, right? Where uh, people are just um, depending on uh, the people in ministry are just depending on charity and not earning their livelihood. We don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. Yes, there were people contributing to the ministry of the Lord, but all these people were doing whatever they can to su continue supporting themselves. They were not a burden to society. You know, so um, if you look at Paul, he follows the same practice later. He is deeply interested in spiritual matters. He, in fact, uh, chooses to be trained under Gamaliel. He chooses to buy heart, you know, because you know, in those days, I mean, uh, someone like uh, who's getting someone who's getting trained under Gamaliel would have had to buy heart huge chunks of the Old Testament. So he did all of that. He and he and later on, when we you know uh, we, we when he's talking, I think, in um, Galatians, is it? Or is it in Philippians? He says, uh, when it comes to the matters of the law, I kept it most perfectly. So when, when it came to all the spiritual matters, Paul was fully, completely involved in all these uh, religious, spiritual things. But he never depended on the charity of people. He taught himself a trade. He taught himself how to make tents. And that's basically what he did. He supported himself. I mean, before he became a believer, after he became a believer, he had a um, means of livelihood. In the same way, the disciples over here, they're not going to sit around waiting upon other people to you know, uh, give them uh, money. 
this is their way of earning a livelihood and so they go fishing i don't think they committed any kind of crime in going and fishing they were supporting themselves you know they would gather the fish they would sell them they would uh, feed their families uh, so so over here you know even as we just look at the beginning of this chapter even as we're entering into this chapter uh, let us understand that these disciples have not committed any crime in earning their livelihood now we will go on to see after the break what jesus says to them and we will see in what way we should understand what is being told all right so uh, let's uh, take our break and come back in 10 minutes thank you <laughs> 